Focus on Headline. And let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio this Friday is our reporters Chang Anna and Chong Yin. Guys, welcome back. Good, Good evening. evening. Good evening to you guys. Uh, we are going to uh, talk about the three uh, top diplomats of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan, uh, holding talks on the sidelines of the foreign ministerial meeting of the G20 nations over in uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, there, the envoys uh, highlight the importance of trilateral coordination to respond to North Korea's provocative acts, uh, as well as its uh, military support for Russia's war against Ukraine. And now you're going to start us off. Uh, let's talk about the tri uh, trilateral talks that were uh, took place on Thursday. Sure. Now, South Korean Foreign Minister Cho Tae-yeol, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, and Japanese Foreign Minister Yoko Kamikawa held a trilateral meeting on the margins of the foreign minister's meeting of the group of 20 nations in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, the first three-way gathering since Cho took office last month came as the three nations have been deepening their cooperation on various issues, ranging from North Korean nuclear threats to economic security and export controls on technologies with security risks. Now, Secretary Blinken, Foreign Minister Kamikawa, and Foreign Minister Cho also discussed the importance of building on close coordination in response to the DPRK's continued provocations, as well as Pyongyang's growing military support for Russia's ongoing war against Ukraine. Now, their discussions on the North came amid concerns that Pyongyang could engage in major provocations ahead of South Korea's parliamentary elections in April and the U.S. presidential election in November. That's right. Of course, uh, as w one of the things that's been highlighted is the fact that uh, since Foreign Minister Cho Tae-yeol took office as the latest uh, Seoul Foreign Minister. It is the first uh, three-way talks. There's other meetings ahead. But uh, the three envoys also discussing efforts to maintain stability across the Taiwan Strait. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly maybe a topic that uh, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken might have brought up. Also, the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas over in Gaza, uh, not to mention the urgent need to release all the remaining hostages and increase aid to the Palestinian civilians. Uh, let's get more on this. Yes, indeed. And uh, during the talks, Blinken reiterated the need for closer tripartite collaboration because all of the issues that SJ just mentioned. Now, the three sides addressed efforts to deter North Korea's illegal cyber activities aimed at financing its nuclear and missile development programs, according According to a release by South Korea's foreign ministry. And they also committed to continuing close consultations this year and strengthening their trilateral communication at the vice foreign minister level. Now, Blinken took stock of progress that the three countries have made since the landmark trilateral Camp David summit that South Korean President Yoon suk yeol U.S. President Joe Biden, and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida held at the presidential retreat in Maryland in August last year. Now, the summit produced a series of agreements, including the three countries' commitment to consult each other in the event of a shared threat and cooperation in various other fields. South Korean Minister Cho called the tripartite meeting a symbolic milestone as the three countries have been deepening and broadening cooperation. And Kamikawa expressed her eagerness to work together with her South Korean and U.S. counterparts to handle evolving North Korean threats. Now, the Camp David summit marked a culmination of the three country's efforts to deepen trilateral cooperation to deal with shared challenges. And the efforts for deeper three-way engagement gained traction as uh, relations between Seoul and Tokyo, long strained over historical issues, have warmed since the South Korean president offered a solution to address the thorny issue of Japan's wartime forced labor in March last year. Kind of have to wonder, if you look at uh, the uh, two-way talks that took place with uh, uh, Foreign Minister Cho tae and his Japanese counterpart the day before, one of the things that they, they, they had differing views on some of the major issues. And I think the, the big thing was the fact that uh, the, uh, at least according to the statement that was released by the Japanese Foreign Ministry, they refused to use the word condemn when they were talking about North Korea's continuous provocation. And that, again, is the fact that North Korea has reached out to uh, Japan in what could potentially be a meeting between uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and uh, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, uh, although 
the the topic of discussion might be something that's up in the air. And so they're being a little bit cautious here. And the two diplomats on Wednesday did discuss how they're going to go about approaching this. But I think the bigger thing now is the three envoys that includes the U.S. top envoy getting into the discussions here, whether or not they discuss how to go about speaking to North Korea, although this obviously was not mentioned in any of the reports there. But there is a possibility that the U.S. is going to be watching over this uh, concerning the fact that right now Japan seems to be only open to holding any kind of discussions uh, with Japan but uh, with uh, with uh, Japan but that North Korea has come out saying that they're, they're not going to talk about number one the abductee issue number two any denuclearization talks so I don't know what the two sides going to be talking about if this meeting does end up play, uh, taking place but it seems like the three countries are going to be talking uh, closely in regards to this uh, also having uh, joined the foreign ministerial meeting of the G20 nations for the very first time since taking office as the foreign minister. Uh, South Korea's foreign minister Cho tae also met with diplomats from several countries, including Indonesia, Canada, and the MICTA countries. We're talking about Mexico, Indonesia, Turkey, and Australia. Uh, yeah, let's get the latest on Korea's efforts to reinforce its diplomatic partnerships. Sure. So Seoul's foreign ministry announced Thursday that Minister Cho tae met with his Indonesian counterpart, Retno Marsudi, during the multilateral gatherings that we've been discussing so far. So they have committed to ongoing collaboration for the co-development of KF-21 fighter jet project. Now that has experienced some delays due to Jakarta's suspended contributions towards its financial share. Now despite financial hiccups with Jakarta's uh, delayed payments, both nations Nations are keen on continuing the strategic collaboration, uh, which commenced back in 2015 with Indonesia agreeing to fund 20% of the 8.1 trillion won project. Now, the project is to last until 2026, with Indonesia receiving one prototype and technology transfer and producing 48 units within the country. Now, the ministers also touched upon enhancing bilateral economic ties with discussions on improving Indonesia. Indonesia's import quota and receiving, revising the bilateral double taxation avoidance agreement, uh, which aims to foster a better business investment environment for South Korean businesses within Indonesia. Minister Cho also engaged with Canadian Foreign Minister Melanie Jolie, now focusing on bolstering economic security cooperation and addressing key regional and global issues. They pledged to expedite action plans under their comprehensive strategic partnership in the follow-up uh, uh, to the 2022 Leaders' Summit and agreed to organize a 2 plus 2 meeting involving both countries' foreign and defense ministers. Now, on the multilateral front, Cho participated in a session of MICTA, an informal consultative body uh, comprising Mexico, Indonesia, Turkey, uh, South Korea, and Australia uh, that uh, aim at promoting cooperation among middle part nations. So uh, Minister Cho emphasized MICTA's potential in fostering global solidarity and proposed initiatives in areas like food security and digital transformation. Now, the MICTA ministers uh, issued a joint communique underscoring their collective stance on pressing international matters, including the Ukraine conflict, the Gaza Strip crisis, and North Korea's ongoing nuclear provocations. Now, the commitment to bolstering multilateralism and pursuing sustainability goals was also reiterated. The meeting with uh, his uh, Indonesian uh, counterpart, uh, I do wonder because, again, the big thing is regards to the joint collaboration in creating the KF-21s. And uh, again, uh, Yane did mention the fact that uh, Jakarta has been continuously uh, late on the payments. Uh, they have not gone anywhere near the 20% that they've agreed on. But the other news that came out, I believe, uh, uh, was it towards the end of last year or the beginning of this year was the fact that Indonesia was caught, I believe, uh, trying to take some of the inf uh, data, mm -hmm. uh, uh, information regards to the development of the KF-21s. And uh, that doesn't look good. And I don't know if they were able to talk about that stuff. Uh, also, the leaders of Group of Seven countries gathering this weekend, they're expected to adopt a joint statement condemning North Korea's armed shipments to Russia. Hannah, let's get the latest on this. Sure. 
Uh, now, G7 uh, leaders have obtained a draft joint statement to be adopted at a video summit on Saturday, as the Ukraine-Russia war has been ongoing for over two years now. And according to reports, the draft joint statement included condemning North Korea for providing ballistic missiles to Russia. And it also calls for Iran to stop providing military aid to Russia and expresses concern about military supplies being shipped through China. And North Korea and Russia have been suspected of trading arms since North Korean leader Kim Jong-un traveled to Russia last September and met with President Vladimir Putin. Now, Ukraine's SBU announced Thursday that it has confirmed that Russia used more than 20 North Korean Hwasong-11 ballistic missiles to attack Ukraine. So the European Union plans to include North Korea, which has provided missiles to Russia in its 13th round of sanctions against Russia, which it will announce on Saturday. This is the first time the EU has sanctioned North Korea in connection with Russia's war in Ukraine. Now, the G7 leaders <coughs> excuse me, will call on Russia to fully and unconditionally withdraw its troops from Ukraine and pledge to never recognize the results of any elections Russia holds now or in the future in the occupied territories. Furthermore, the G7 leaders also reportedly spoke by phone with Ukrainian President Zelensky during the video summit and pledged increased military assistance and arms supplies to Ukraine. And the U.S. government is also planning to impose sanctions on more than 500 targets linked to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This was reported by AFP on Thursday, citing a U.S. Treasury Department spokesman who said the anti-Russian sanctions, which the Biden administration is expected to announce on Friday, will target Russia and those who help Russia and Russia's war machine. Reuters also reported that the U.S. plans to sanction more than 500 targets, citing Deputy Treasury Secretary Wally Adenyemo, and the sanctions which join others target not only Russia's military-industrial complex, but also companies in third countries that help Russia obtain needed goods. Again, there is a reason why we're getting these uh, massive sanctions come Saturday. Uh, this Saturday is going to mark exactly two years mm-hmm. uh, since the war in Ukraine uh, began. We talked about the unprecedented 13th package of sanctions from the EU, uh, which now includes North Korea. But I believe uh, the U.S. sanctions that's going to be slapped on by uh, onto uh, Russia also linked with uh, the recent death of Alexei Navalny. I believe uh, uh, President Joe Biden had met with the widow and the daughter of uh, Navalny uh, in California uh, just about, uh, was it uh, Wednesday or Thursday, I believe, they, they uh, met. And uh, shortly after the meeting there, the White House released a statement that it's going to be a major uh, sanction uh, towards Putin and his government. We'll see what kind of uh, sanctions we'll be seeing there. We're going to be moving on uh, to a topic and an issue that uh, we have been, unfortunately, uh, looking taking a close tab on for a bit too long. And the reason we see this is because more and more as this collective action drags on, we are starting to see more and more people just around us uh, affected by the vacuum within the medical system Uh, caused by the trainee doctors and their walkout and their resignation. Uh, With this, the government has raised its uh, healthcare service crisis gauge the highest level of serious. Uh, As of 8 a.m. this morning, you have Prime Minister Han Duk-su announcing the extension of operating hours for public medical institutions to mitigate the impact of the doctors' walkout. Yane, let's get more on this. Sure. So in response to this ongoing collective action by doctors against the increase in medical school admissions quota, the government is uh, seemingly now taking some decisive steps to ensure the continuity of medical services. Now, it is indeed unprecedented to elevate the public health alert to its highest level of serious. Now, this is even more so if you consider that it marks the first ever occasion that the alert related to public health has reached its highest scale, even though we have seen some equivalent level of alerts declared for other types of legally defined crises, uh, such as the infectious disease crisis alert for COVID-19. Now, of course, this move underscores the severity of the current healthcare crisis, and the Prime Minister outlined measures to expand weekend and holiday services of all public healthcare institutions and the establishment of four additional regional situation rooms in order to facilitate the transport of severely ill emergency patients in early March. 
Now, the government has also allowed telemedicine services until the collective action of the medical community comes to an end. Now, the government is also looking to ease regulations on hiring medical personnel, aiming to alleviate the workload on the existing medical workforce that continues to serve amidst this protest. In this ongoing walkout, we have seen over 8,000 trainee doctors or more than 60% of the country's interns and residents uh, from some 94 major hospitals nationwide leaving their positions as of late last night. Now, this has led to some significant disruptions in medical services, uh, including the cancellation of surgeries and the turning away of emergency care patients uh, that totaling 189 cases report reported until the 21st. And I believe the number is still growing. So Mm. in Seoul, major hospitals are scrambling to fill the vacuum, reducing surgeries by 30 to 50 percent and a limit on new patient appointments. Now, if you look at some hospitals, they have shifted from three to two shifts and now covered by uh, professor level doctors and attending doctors in order to maintain this 24 hour emergency services. Professors are also taking on additional duties, including outpatient care, surgeries, inpatient management, and night shifts in order to bridge the treatment gap. Now, what's more concerning actually is the report that the contract renewal period is upcoming in March. So, the Korea Medical Association. An insider said around 30% of entire doctors in major hospitals will be gone by March, and the true frustrating situation hasn't even started yet. Yeah, so what's happening right now is two things, right? It's interesting you mentioned this uh, whole contract renewal mm-hmm. period because uh, when the trainee doctors had handed in their resignation letters, right? There is a reason why they handed in their resignation and they're not going, we're striking and we're refusing to work because you can't do that, all right? You can't do that as a doctor. So Mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're resigning. So they're saying, legally, come on, if I want to quit, I should be allowed to quit, which is what uh, I believe the the Korean Medical Association's uh, Emergency Response Measure Committee chief had said was, yes, the lives of people are precious, but uh, the doctor's rights to choose whether we want to work is also very much important. And this is them saying, hey, in any other jobs, we're allowed, you know, you're allowed to hand in your resignation letters and you're allowed to quit and so forth. But what happened is that uh, because of the government order, the hospitals actually did not accept the resignation letters, right? That's the thing, right? That's like the process, right? I mean, we're, we're different, we're, free, uh, we're freelancers. We don't go through that. We just go, we quit and that's it. But for them, they're going resignation letter and the hospital has to accept it and then, then you're good to go. But that didn't happen. And so they're saying technically they're still in there, but now they're playing with another a little bit of a loophole saying that if their contract is done and over with by March, then really it doesn't matter if there's any sort of back to work order that's put in place. We are technically not under the contract anymore. It doesn't matter if you haven't uh, accepted our resignation letters. We're no longer under contract is what they're doing. And so this is why it gets really, really messy right now. And again, I, I don't know if anyone thought this was going to go this far right now. And it seems to be just a bit of a, a, a stalemate at this time. We'll keep a close tap, and especially with the weekend, uh, there should be a lot of developments happening. Whether or not this is going to expand into next week, we'll have to see. Moving on, the first day of the two-day interpolation session being held over at the National Assembly uh, starting on Thursday. Uh, Let's get the latest on this, Hannah. Sure. Uh, Now, the ruling People Power Party addressed concerns raised by doctors' groups about a possible decrease in education quality due to the expansion of the medical school's quota. Prime Minister Han Dok-su expressed confidence that schools can manage the increase without lowering quality, noting that the government had consulted with universities and experts on that matter. And questioned by the main opposition Democratic Party of Korea on North Korea, Han said the government has emphasized multiple times its openness to talks with Pyongyang. And another question and answer session is scheduled for Friday afternoon, this time related to the economy. Now, the ruling and opposition parties are expected to clash over economic policies, including last year's economic report card and the UN administration's tax policy 
committee during the interpolation session. The ruling PPP plans to highlight achievements such as defense exports and improved fiscal health over the past year, while pressing for the Democratic Party's cooperation on civic issues such as delay on the application of the Serious Accidents Punishment Act to businesses with fewer than 50 employees. And in response, the Democratic Party is expected to call for a review of the current government's economic policies, citing last year's economic growth rate, which fell below to the 1% range. And the DP will point out issues such as R&D budget cuts, tax revenue shortfalls, and prolonged high inflation. You have the new Reform Party chairman. Now, I guess we can call him a uh, chairman and not a co-chairman anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lee Jun-sak, he is, of course, the former PPP chairman and now the chairman of the new Reform Party. Uh, He is going to be, uh, I guess, by himself uh, leading this party with the departure of Inagyan. Uh, we talked about uh, Inagyan coming out saying that uh, he's going to be uh, leaving the party just after 11 days, I believe, uh, since making the announcement of the of the merger here. Uh, he has officially appointed Kim Jong-in. Uh, he is nicknamed the Kingmaker uh, because of his roles of kind of setting, setting uh, paving the way for uh, many Big names out there in the political arena. Uh, he is also the former interim leader of the People Power Party. He is the now chairman of the election nomination committee. Yane, let's get the latest on this. Mm-hmm. So, though this is now coming in later than their initial plan, uh, having Kim Jong Un on board is truly an important move for the for this new party, according to the party leader Lee Jun Sok. Now, Lee cited his unparalleled accomplishments in leading electoral vi- electoral victories in the past, and the nomination committee chairman is expected to play a crucial role in this uh, coming election, wielding some considerable influence over nomination decisions. Kim Jong Un's extensive experience in leading both both major parties' interim leadership positions makes him as a key figure capable of orchestrating some winning nomination strategy for the new Reform Party, just as SJ said. So the decision to approach Kim apparently had been in the works even before the departure of Inagyeon's new future party faction from the Big Tent. Now, Kim Jong-un has been a political mentor to not only Lee jun Seok but also the uh, another party's high official, Kim tae Uh So he had previously shown reluctance to assume this role of this uh, chairman position. However, his decision to accept the position appears to be driven by his own concerns concerns over the current political climate in South Korea and the perceived incompetence of the opposition. Uh, of the opposition. So with Kim Jong-un's expertise, especially in areas such as health insurance and pension reform back in the 1970s, the party is now poised to introduce some significant policy proposals in pension system, medical insurance, and welfare. The party plans to complete forming the nomination committee by this weekend, with the first meeting potentially taking place as early as Monday. Let's move on here. Uh, Some of the big news uh, over the past 24 hours. Uh, I think uh, especially this company being a very popular uh, company amongst the the South Korean investors were big on uh, U.S. stocks. Uh, Stock rally powered ahead of the uh, as uh, NVIDIA. Uh, This is a major AI semiconductor uh, chip making company, their bullish outlook rekindled the artificial intelligence mania, and uh, the data shows the world's largest economy is still going strong. Hannah, let's get the latest on this. Sure. The Dow Jones 30 Industrial Average closed at record highs on Thursday, reaching above the thir- three- 39,000 mark for the first time ever, while the S&P 500 posted its biggest gain since January of last year, reaching a new all-time high. The tech-heavy Nasdaq shot up nearly 3% on the heels of the chipmaker's results, close to breaking the November 2021 all-time high. Now, stocks powered higher as Wall Street celebrated NVIDIA's blowout quarterly results, which beat sky-high expectations. And that reassured investors about the strength of the AI mania that has lifted U.S. stock gauges to record highs. The chipmaker CEO said that generative AI has the has hit the tipping point as it reported a 265% rise in revenue and laid out very upbeat guidance, a sign demand for AI hardware is booming. NVIDIA 
shares climbed about 16% to hit a record high, and the stock added $277 billion to its market cap on Thursday, the largest single-day increase ever. Now, the bullish mood spread worldwide with chip stock gains, helping Japan's Nikkei 225 index to finally beat a record that had stood since 1989. And similarly, techs boosted the pan-European stock 600 to a fresh all-time intraday high. In addition, other semiconductor-related stocks surged on the back of NVIDIA's enthusiasm, and other large-cap stocks like Meta and Amazon also led the rally. Analysts believe that NVIDIA's optimistic outlook is fueling a renewed enthusiasm for AI stocks, and others are concerned about the overvaluation of semiconductor and AI-related stocks. And amid the ebullience, an assessment of the Fed's next move appeared to be on the back burner. The central bank's latest minutes showed most officials want to tread uh, carefully on rate cuts, seeing risks to, in moving too quickly. Just to kind of explain uh, how massive this uh, rise in NVIDIA stock prices has been. I, I heard about NVIDIA for the very first time back in 2002. Mm. Uh, this was when I was first playing this game called Diablo Yane, uh, <laughs> Diablo 2, the original one. And back then, high school, I was in high school back then, uh, if you had money, you used NVIDIA graphic cards. Like that, That's what they were known for back then. Like They just made really, really good uh, graphic cards, and that's about it. And so back in 2002, uh, when NVIDIA was known for their graphic card, it was $5 a share uh, was what it is. And now it ended uh, at uh, $785.38 here. Uh, it went 95,678.05 percent mm. rise uh, since 2000. Uh, since uh, what is it? The 1990, 1999. It was 87 cents, ladies and gentlemen. Cents. So we wow. saw the impacts of N uh, Nvidia's meteoric rise over the past 24 hours, which also, by the way, impacted uh, South Korean stocks. Uh, I mm. think uh, SK Hynix, uh, which is sort of equivalent to like the South Korean version of NVIDIA went up uh, something uh, more than 3% today. Uh, speaking of SK Hynix, another SK affiliated company here, the U.S. government will be helping South Korean semiconductor company SK Siltron uh, to expand production over in the U.S. with a loan as part of its efforts to strengthen the U.S. semiconductor supply chain. Yane, let's get more on this. So in its press release, uh, the United States Department of Energy has announced a conditional approval to lend $544 million, or 720 billion Korean won, to SK Siltron CSS, which is a U.S. subsidiary of the South Korean semiconductor uh, company SK Siltron. Now, this significant financial boost aims to expand the production of silicon carbide wafers in the United States, which is apparently a critical component in making next-generation power semiconductors used in electric vehicles and energy storage systems. Now, SK Siltron CSS is currently operating its factory in Bay City, Michigan. The company is at the forefront of producing high-quality silicon carbide wafers, and with the electric vehicle demand on the rise, the demand for these wafers is also expected to surge, highlighting the importance of this investment in addressing the current supply shortfall. The department emphasized that this loan project would not only help SK Siltron CSS increase its supply capacity, but it would also create up to 200 construction jobs and another 200 high-wage skilled positions at its Bay City uh, factory area. Now, this move is anticipated to bolster the U.S. manufacturing sector and reinforce its global leadership in clean energy technologies. Uh, President Joe Biden also made his visit to the Space City facility back in November 2022, uh, which, is, uh, which underscores the administration's commitment to uh, securing the semiconductor supply chain as part of its broader strategy in order to expand electric vehicle adoption. Now, the department highlighted that the Bay City facility will be named as one of the world's top five silicon carbide wafer manufacturing facilities, presenting a brighter future of American manufacturing that would come with this decision. And uh, speaking of South Korean companies, uh, I guess expanding their market overseas, let's talk about the head mm -hmm. of uh, Hyundai Motor, uh, who recently visited Brazil. Uh, there he pledged 1.1 billion U.S. dollars to the South American nation by 2032. Uh, this according to the company's statement on Friday. Hannah, let's get the details of this. Yes. 
Now, during a courtesy call to Brazilian president on Thursday, Lee Sun Chong, who is the chairman of Hyundai Motor Group, said Hyundai's Brazilian unit and its local partners will invest $1.1 billion in areas of green and future technologies by 2032. Chong explained Hyundai's electrification strategy to Lula, which encompasses electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles, in order to achieve zero carbon emissions. He also stressed hydrogen energy as being a key tool for addressing climate change and an important resource that complements electrification efforts. Hyundai Motor has operated a manufacturing plant in Piracicaba in the Brazilian state of Sao Paulo uh, since November 2012, and it serves as Hyundai's sole manufacturing base across the Central and South American region. And according to the company, Chong expressed gratitude for the Brazilian government's continued interest and support for Hyundai Motor's operation in Brazil and introduced various efforts by the company for employees and the local community. He also expressed his awareness of the Brazilian government's efforts to develop environmentally friendly energy sources as part of its carbon-free policy and stressed that Hyundai is willing to contribute to such efforts in Brazil. And Brazil has been implementing multifaceted environmentally friendly policies with the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 50 percent compared with 2005 levels by 2030 under the goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. Now, Chung also explained Hyundai Motors' efforts in areas of advanced air mobility and small modular reactors and expressed hopes for collaboration in these fields with Brazil. Now, Hyundai Motors said the group is expanding its global hydrogen network to Central and South America, with Brazil at the forefront. And last year, it established a dedicated unit for hydrogen projects in Central and South America in Brazil. Just kind of curious, uh, if the Brazilian government, if they are trying to be more environmental friendly, if they're uh, working on the the major issue of the deforestation over in the Amazon, that's been a major issue uh, over the past decade or so, but uh, just a side thought there. Uh, Today, a monumental leap for private space exploration. Uh, Intuitive Machines, a U.S. aerospace company, has uh, successfully landed its lunar spacecraft, Adesis, near the moon's south pole. And this historic event marks a significant milestone, not just for the intuitive machines for being the very first uh, private company to succeed in moon landing, but also for humanity's lunar aspirations, right? There's always been this, I guess, uh, uh, romanticization of uh, walking on the moon and uh, lunar landings and so forth. Uh, Yang, let's get the details of this. So Intuitive Machines CEO Stefan Altimus shared this exciting news during a live broadcast today uh, where he said, I would like to directly quote him, I know this was a nail biter, but we are on the surface and we are transmitting. Welcome to the moon. So he acknowledged the precise status of Odysseus, also known as Nova C, is yet to be fully determined. However, he confirmed that it did make its contact with the lunar surface. Uh, this mission is part of NASA's CLPS, uh, or uh, which is called Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative, under the Artemis program of NASA uh, that aims to open up a new horizon of lunar exploration with private sector partnerships. Now, Odysseus carried six NASA observation and sensing equipment units to the moon, uh, bringing some $118 million to Intuitive Machines for this. These instruments uh, will play a crucial role in studying the lunar environment, being a stepping stone for the ambitious Artemis III mission of NASA, uh, slated for 2026, uh, whose moonshot goal is to bring astronauts back to the moon. Now, notably, this achievement ends the United States' 52-year hiatus in lunar exploration since uh, Apollo 17 in December 1972. Now, for South Korea, which is gearing up for its lunar uh, exploration endeavors with its own space agency to take off during the first half of this year, this news also comes as an encouraging signal because, in particular, the upcoming third launch of Intuitive Machine's Nova C spacecraft later this year will carry Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute's Lunar Space Environment Monitor, or LUSEM, which was already carried to the United States after development in September last year. I'm, I'm, I'm really curious, because we've been seeing over the past few years now uh, more 
news on all these countries doing all these space explorations and so forth. I know India is big on their space mm-hmm. program. China is going in there. Russia has always been in there. Uh, South Korea is really now beginning its uh, early stages of uh, space exploration. But there's always, again, there's two areas that they're really looking at, right? They're looking at the moon. They're looking at the, the Mars, right? The, the fourth planet in the, in the solar system. And you kind of wonder, well, what's all of this uh, exploration on, right? Is, is there Are they really trying to, I believe there were some talks about that people trying to actually live on the moon, right? They were going to send people there, set up uh, a little area there, and then basically uh, try to figure out if people are able to live in, on the moon. And so I, I don't know if this is their sort of a hint to people that, you know, the humanity is doomed and they're trying to find other places uh, to live in. But this is quite interesting. Also, the fact that uh, in the U.S., uh, after Apollo 17, there was no real lunar exploration uh, mm-hmm. after that. And you kind of wonder why, uh, despite the fact that they have now probably some of the best technology, space exploration technologies in the world, right? Uh, nevertheless, guys, as always, thank you very much for coming on a Friday uh, with your reports. Have a safe weekend and uh, looking forward to seeing you guys again. Thank, thank you. you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6pm to 8pm, Korea time.